My name is Alexandra. I'm an art director at the Future Laboratory, where our mission is really to future-proof businesses and organizations. And we do this by offering our clients a sort of glimpse into the future um, through a kind of unique combination of ethnographic research, of expert interviews, and brand strategy. We have an internal team of researchers, experts, and writers who are constantly tracking news stories and product launches to understand uh, how they're going to impact on both brands and consumers, and also how do they fit into this wider network of consumer, technological, economic shifts that we are constantly tracking. Um, and we do research across all of lifestyle industries, um, and we work with luxury as well. Um, today, I'm here to share with you the five trends that we believe brands should really take notice of in order to thrive in the next five years. Um, and we're going to jump sort of between all of the different pockets of luxury. We're going to look at automotive and at fragrance and retail and fashion. So I'm really sorry if it feels a bit like we're jumping all over the place, but it's just so I can give you the juiciest bits, really. Um, so let's dive in. Five trends for the next five years. The first one and most important one, in my opinion at least, is the changing attitudes of the luxury consumers. Today, the dynamic among the society's wealthiest is really changing. Uh, obviously, still there's a large group of luxury consumers who feel very comfortable about their position, but we're also seeing a growing group of high net worth individuals who are increasingly uneasy, maybe even anxious, about how their moral worth is linked to their wealth. And I think the reasons for this are, are pretty obvious. I mean, the kind of gl global rising inequality, it's no longer possible to ignore the potential negative impacts of wealth. Uh, you know, stories about 1% of the richest people in the world owning as much as the other 50%. And I think this is really what's driving a major reassessment today of what's appropriate when it comes to owning investing and showing as well. Uh, so you can see a study here from Boston Private, which found that among US luxuriants with assets ranging from 780,000 pounds to 15.6 million pounds, 30% identified one of the main negatives of being wealthy as people judging their status. And that's because as a society, we are becoming much more aware of this kind of dark side of wealth and our obsession with wealth and the social status that comes with it. I'm going to show you a trailer for a brilliant documentary documentary that really captures this new dynamic. It's called Generation Wealth by Lauren Greenberg. If I want to work 100 hours a week and never see my family and die at an early age, that's my prerogative. I would have money as big as this one and taste it. 33 pounds of gold and diamonds given to me by superstars of the world. I love money. Come to me. I've been a photographer for 25 years, with my lens focused on wealth. I noticed that no matter how much people had, they still want more. I want to figure out why our obsession with wealth has grown. It seemed to be a shift in the American dream. I know the names of the Kardashians better than I know the names of my neighbors. This fictitious lifestyle fuels this sense of inadequacy. I have the classic Birkin in almost every color. The bags start 20,000, go up. I realized wealth was much more than money. It was whatever gave us value. Fame, sex, even plastic surgery for dogs. It's kind of like the end of Rome. Societies accrue their greatest wealth at the moment that they face death. If you look great and you have a nice car, I'm all for it. But at the expense of what? You sell your soul to the devil. I really recommend watching the film film. It's absolutely terrifying and hugely entertaining, as you can imagine. So there's definitely this growing awareness of the kind of dark side of wealth. But that's not the only reason for the rise of what we call and easy affluence. It's really about the origin of the new wealthy class that we see emerging in particular. 
we've lost connection. Um, in particular in the US, we caught up with Matthew Stewart, who's an American philosopher, who told us that in the US in particular, this group is not the 1%. They are the 9.9% who are really holding and shaping the nation's uh, wealth. These individuals often self-made and with more than 935 thousand pounds of net worth are characterized by mid-level mid-level investment bankers doctors dentists and lawyers and they represent very different mindsets to the traditional elite class they are more culturally diverse uh, they dress casually uh, they have faith in facts rather than religion most of them are self-made and really proud of it and despite huge homes and even bigger investment portfolios they just feel uneasy and want to shy away from their affluence and when we spoke to Matthew Stewart who himself is part of this generation he characterize them as um, we are so self-effacing, we deny our own existence, we keep insisting that we are middle class. And this outlook is also extending downwards towards the youngest of the luxury uh, consumers who are increasingly saying that, um, or exhibiting this taste at conspicuous uh, imagery of luxury goods when shared among peers. So a study found that 81% of 13 to 34 year olds agreed that showing off expensive goods that you might have bought on social media is simply not cool and not appropriate anymore. So it's a kind of stark contrast to what we would have seen five or 10 years ago. So what does it mean for luxury brands when kind of you know lavish spending is not aspirational anymore? Uh, what we're imagining with this trend is that in the next five years, we're going to see a huge kind of rise in, in purpose-driven products and services. Uh, for example, lab-grown diamonds, um, cause-driven investing, and equitable luxury travel. Uh, so brands across kind of all pockets of luxury should really take notice and, and start planning how they're going to speak to this new type of luxury consumer. So this was a bit of a serious beginning. And now our second trend is looking at really interesting retail formats that we're um, seeing emerging in the luxury and fashion industry. It's this idea of bundled buys, and it doesn't instinctively sound very luxury. So why is it relevant? Well, because we believe that choice is no longer luxury, simplicity is um, luxury. So this format is about removing the excessive choice from the buying process in favor of a more singular, serene kind of buying experience. Um, and that's because today we are so overwhelmed uh, by choice, mostly because of our digital lives have become so intense, so overwhelming, so immersive and so addictive that we're making tons of these micro decisions every day. And this is why simplicity is now emerging as a form of luxury. So if we look specifically at this new retail format, we have quite a few interesting case studies. Wardrobe, which sells menswear and women's wear as kind of wardrobes compromising uh, of four and eight pieces. They can be bought individually. They all work great together. Uh, the kind of eight piece set is two and a half thousand pounds. The four um, piece set is half the price. So it's obviously tapping into this desire for more affordable luxury that we're seeing in the UK, US, as well as Indian markets. We have a great quote from Christine Centenera, who's the co-founder, who told us that this is their way of saying to people, this season, this is what we think you should be wearing. Being authoritative is our way of providing a solution for people. So really removing that stress of choosing uh, what to wear by providing a, a curated collection. Uh, designers are also using this idea of bundling as a way to streamline choice and eliminate waste. And a really interesting example here is The Kit, launched by Daniel Vosovic, which is a sustainable fast fashion label created as a solution to the waste associated with seasonal fashion. So as the name suggests, they produce um, products in kind of kits, bundles, as a kind of uniform that you can order all together. And what's really interesting is that they really see themselves as a first sustainable fast fashion brand. And that's because all of the products are produced only on demand. So there is no kind of excessive production. There is no shipping of items that will never be bought. There is less waste and less pollution, which is why we have the quote from Daniel who says he doesn't want to add to this culture 
of blatant consumerism. What we also found really interesting with um, the kind of idea of bundled buys is that we've seen a lot of luxury, particularly luxury streetwear brands, um, adopted as a way of, um, of combating the growing resale market, or at least harnessing back some of the huge profits that can be achieved on the reselling websites. And that's simply because if you're selling you know, a product in a bundle of other five products, that kind of initial price is so much higher uh, that it might deter potential reselling buyers. And I think particularly in streetwear, this is really important because individual products, a pair of shoes, can reach such a point of hype uh, that it can be resold for seven or ten times the value. So it's a really interesting format with a lot of different opportunities. And now we're jumping again, completely new industry. Uh, this next trend explores how luxury car manufacturers are increasingly borrowing solutions from the sharing economy in order to provide levels of convenience beyond the kind of standard uh, traditional forms of ownership. We've been tracking this shift for a while, and one really interesting example is the Bentley On Demand service, uh, which is aimed at embellishing rather than replacing completely uh, kind of traditional ownership. So it's a free um, service which can be accessed through the Bentley app, and it allows you to rent any car from the Bentley range. And it's aimed specifically at occasions where your own vehicle might be inappropriate. So for example, you're doing a long trip or you're traveling overseas, with the Bentley on demand, the car will be conveyed to and from your location. And what's really interesting is that it's being delivered by a concierge who kind of gives you a little uh, tour of the key features of the car before handing it over. So it's adding this element of product discovery onto the core offer of, of car hire. Uh, another really interesting example is Book by Cadillac. Uh, it's a subscription service aimed at kind of first time Cadillac buyers or users in this case. Um, it's, it's basically a subscription service which you pay for monthly, so it's very easy to cancel if you decide after 30 days, I've seen enough. Uh, you can swap your car 18 times a year. So it's a really good way of giving um, users a taste of the different products that Cadillac have in their range without really having to commit to one in particular. Uh, and I think that's really important to say that Cadillac in the long run see this more as a kind of marketing sales tool rather than an end in itself. <laughs> Finally, the most, I think, developed execution of this trend is a new business model that is being launched by Volvo this year. Uh, so Volvo are already offering a subscription-only um, kind of service. It's called Care by Volvo, uh, and I think it uh, encompasses three different car makes. But this year, they're launching a completely new brand called Polestar, which will only be available on a subscription uh, model. The first product will be launched uh, mid this year. It will be available on a two and three year basis. What's really interesting is that you'll only be able to buy it, or I guess by the next two years, uh, online, and you don't need any deposit. So it's really kind of um, changing and, and um, I guess, rejecting the traditional model of automotive retail where you would go to dealership potentially. Um, what's really interesting about the Polestar brand is that it's designed a, as a digital first product. Uh, so all of the interactions, both with the Polestar brand and with the car itself, will happen via your mobile. One really interesting key, uh, feature of this will be a virtual key, which means that you can unlock your car just with your phone, and you can also share it with your colleague, with your partner, so they can do the same. And again, obviously, this opens a whole range of opportunities uh, for brands, for kind of new consumer services, such as pickup and delivery for servicing and charging. So it's a really, really interesting uh, concept and also a really interesting campaign that Volvo commissioned around it.
So it's obviously interesting how strongly anti-consumption uh, it is. Our next uh, trend takes us into a completely different luxury territory, the luxury fragrance um, kind of category. So for the last two years, we've seen a real growth in niche fragrances. And that's simply because uh, brands really need to push the boundaries of scent today in order to stand out from the crowd. Because what consumers really want from fragrances is primarily differentiation. Uh, leading the way here are brands like Parterre, which explores these ideas through limited production and distribution to increase appeal. They're also playing on the provenance, as you can see. All of the ingredients that are used are grown, harvested, and distilled in one very particular private botanical garden in Kingston Mill in Dorset. We are also seeing a move towards kind of softer, less obvious olfactive profiles, and in particular fra fragrances that enhance the wearer's natural scent rather than giving them a different one. Uh, and here we have perfumes like Glossier's You and Nasamoto's Nudi Florum. And I really like how Rachel Syme um, kind of analyzes this for the New York Times. She says that the makers of these new scents are betting that millennials are averse to pouring on a pre-packaged personality. And to prove her right, Glossier's Year was named as Fragrance of the Year in 2018 by the Fragrance Foundation. So a really interesting new growing category. Uh, so we're seeing the kind of rise of these softer, more personal narratives. But at the same time, there's a new host of brands that really want to grab attention and maybe even challenge the very idea of what a fine fragrance should be. Uh, one concept that continues to capture the attention and the imagination is the idea of cosmos and trying to translate cosmic phenomena into fragrance. Uh, so here we have Oliver & Co's Veil, which is the imagined smell of the Veil Nebula, the draped debris of a massive star that exploded 8,000 years ago. I'm personally very drawn to this um, description alone. Then we have Nishan's B612, which aims to evoke its namesake asteroid, which is found in the novella The Little Prince. Uh, if you're curious what an asteroid smells like, they use the fragrance notes of cypress, patchouli, and tonka bean. Um, and finally, what's really interesting is a kind of whole new category of brands that are really um, kind of proposing products and maybe messaging that contradicts the idea of what a fine fragrance is. And the best example here is the I Am Trash perfume, which is the first luxury perfume made from botanical waste. And the brand really wanted to address the kind of uh, issue of sustainability in the production of fragrance. So the fragrance is made completely from the waste from the fragrance making process. I will show you what that process looks like. I'm gonna be honest, not all of it is pretty. Trash. But never waste. The most wanted scent made from the unwanted. Mi fleur du déchet. Et tes livres d'orange. The sound that makes it worse than the visual. Uh, but it's obviously interesting to show because it's such a striking divergence from how we're used to seeing uh, fragrance advertising. And it's so interesting to see something that is both desirable and grotesque at the same time time. And finally, I couldn't talk about the next five years without talking about augmented reality uh, and how that's going to reshape retail in the years to come. And I think we touched upon this both in the presentation and in the panel, and I think we're all aligned on the role that kind of mobile augmented reality will play for retailers in particular, I think, in the future. Uh, we're getting to a really interesting point where merged reality and augmented reality are becoming a practical tool for retailers rather than just being a kind of marketing uh, gimmick because we all know augmented reality can be a little bit primitive and temperamental. Now it's becoming much more stable and refined. So the mobile augmented reality is expected to be the primary driver for the entire VR 
AR MR market, uh, as it's and supposed to reach a value of 77.4 billion pounds by 2021. Uh, there are interesting brands that are already tapping into this potential, for example, Nike with their sneakers app, which allows consumers to access and buy limited edition shoes through the app by pointing the camera um, at real life objects at different times of the day. So it's kind of mimicking the idea of a product drop you would experience in store, but in the virtual setting in a very successful way. And I think this quote we have here um, really kind of brings to life the impact that augmented reality will have on our everyday interactions. At some point, we're going to look back and think, how did we not have a digital layer on the physical world? Uh, that's from Greg Jones, director of VR and AR at Google, and obviously he would say that. Uh, but we're also seeing a wave of brands that are already kind of experimenting within this area. And one really interesting example that we saw was a collaboration between H&M and Moschino. They presented their new collection, which was designed jointly in a kind of uh, merged reality runway experience. It's Mosquito! Let me explain if you can't really tell what's happening here. Uh, so guests at the show were invited to come into a room that was designed to look as one of this kind of old multicolored televisions. And once inside, they were um, they were invited to kind of put on a Magic Leap headset, which overlays an augmented reality kind of layer on top of the physical reality. So that's the room was actually empty, but they could see all of the elements within it through augmented reality in, in quite a vibrant detail. Um, and finally, in the next five years, we're going to see uh, the rise of digital-only clothing that exists as an augmented reality overlay. And I know it sounds really futuristic, but some of it is happening uh, already, where we're seeing garments designed for use in social media or gaming rather than physical reality. One really interesting example is a recent collaboration between retailer Carlings and a digital um, kind of influencer called called Pearl.www. Um, they created together a collection of digital-only clothing, which can be applied onto your social me media feeds. So the idea is that if, if you just want to be seen wearing something, you don't have to actually physically own it. And I really recommend trying this out, out if you just type in digital collection carling so you can see yourself wearing one of the outfits. Uh, you do have to send, a, send your picture, you have to pay a small fee, and then your image is being reconstructed as a kind of 3D environment with the garment applied on top of it. And then this is posted to your social media feed. So you can see some of the examples here. So a lot of this is happening already. Ooh, sound. Um, and finally, if we look towards the kind of outer edge of these five years, uh, we might see um, consumers using augmented layers and holograms um, as kind of accessories and garments in real life. So much in the same way that we saw, um, you know, guests at the Moschino show wearing Magic Leap headsets and being able to view garments that weren't really there, we could in very much the same way imagine, you know, wearing augmented reality designed on top of our clothing. Uh, this is obviously quite future-facing. It's an idea championed by a really interesting uh, digital fashion house called The Fabricant. They show their first collection, which you can see examples of here, at the Fashion Clash Festival in Maastricht uh, last year. So digital immaterial fashion is coming in some form. Whether it will reshape how we dress in physical life, I'm not sure yet, but it will certainly revolutionize the way that we portray ourselves um, across social digital channels, just giving us that level of creativity and experimentation that wouldn't be possible in real life. So those are the kind of highlights. Um, let me just take you quickly for our lab notes. Those are the four things that you should take away from today, if nothing else. Uh, first of all, wealthy consumers are more conscientious than ever. So try and create goods and services that help to support and convey their awareness of people, the planet, and social causes. This will become really key. Uh, secondly, the millennial mindset continues to steer new trends in luxury, with the sharing economy changing how people think of everything from hotel services 
to car ownership. Transformation still remains key for luxuriance, whether it's in the context of traveling or finding a niche fragrance. These consumers want unique experiences that represent them personally. And finally, ownership will gain a new meaning. At present, consumers still believe that tangible products have more value than the digital ones, but as we buy more digital ephemera, they will become accustomed to ownership not necessarily being equated with tangibility and the value of digital will rise. Very long-winded way of saying of what I was just saying before in the trend, but we really believe that this kind of digital immaterial products and services are on the rise and will, will become a kind of um, key, I guess, product in the next five years. Thank you. Sandra, there's always a huge amount of inspiration and room for thought, lots of discussion okay. over lunchtime. Uh, do you have a quick question? Has anyone got any questions? Yes, please, and then we'll go for lunch. People are leaving. Have you got a mic? <laughs> <laughs> I might yeah. hear you. <laughs> That was great. I think I'm going to have to rewrite my presentation for this afternoon because you've just given it. So thanks for that. Um, look, I, I really great. I, I really challenge that first uh, assumption. I watched that documentary and it is funny, but then I'm a, I'm a left wing liberal kind of guy laughing at that type of thing, which is a very elitist thing to do. There's no evidence that, I mean, I'd love to see the evidence that, number, that your first point is right. And if we think about the political climate we're in, if we think about lots mm. of the ruling classes actually going against that, denying yes. climate change, for example, and actually tax cuts very much for the wealthy still, it seems to me that we're in completely the opposite cycle at the moment to what you're saying. I think, we're, I think there's truth to what you're saying, absolutely. And I think the change that we will see is in response to what we're seeing today. Absolutely, you know, one of the reasons why wealth is becoming a kind of uneasy commodity is the kind of, you know, very prominent politicians that we're seeing today who are representing, you know, a certain vision of what luxury is. So I think we're going to reach a point where this is just simply going to have to change. Keep in mind... What we track is very much the kind of early adopters. It's, it's, if you think about change as a kind of curve, we're looking at here as a kind of, as a way of forecasting what's going, happen, what's going to happen next. So we're not saying that this is happening on a huge scale, but we're saying that these attitudes are on the rise and they're expected to, to grow even more. And also, we need to have some hope. If we believe that the other side is going to win, then why are we, we doing it? We need to man the barricades is what you're saying, right? <laughs> Enjoy your lunch. We'll see you this morning. Enjoy your lunch.